thank you so much for joining this particular webinar. I do hope that you're going to learn one or two things about, I really can't say this word, so I'll use the short form, uh, PCOS, as one of my colleagues calls it. If you're new here, my good name is Mozoni Njogu, and I'm the managing partner of Njogu and Associate Advocates. So besides offering legal services to our clients and customers in the corporate commercial world, we also have this segment called Life and Law, where we're able to discuss matters that touch on our lives and also affect the daily uh, productivity when we're within our workspaces. And it is important to always try and you know, decode, decipher that what we are trying to accommodate within our workspaces, we try and understand what exactly it is that we are dealing with. One of the most interesting things that when we have had this conversation about um, employee wellness within the workspace, and I'm very happy that I'm also joined, uh, joined by Dr. Joe and his team, is the last time we discussed the matters to do with endometriosis. And a lot of the questions that were emanating from that conversation is the role of also the insurance company. So we have really seen that question, how we can have a more elaborate conversation, even when it comes to the insurance industry, how it accommodates the employee who is who is going to work um, at their various workplaces and also how these conditions affect them and how they can be accommodated from a medical perspective. So I hope that our next webinars will be able to carry that conversation on. So without further ado, um, I will invite Dr. Joe. I know he's with his colleague here. So he'll introduce as well his colleague who is um, going to be with him in this webinar and taking us through the presentation. A few house rules please let us um, have the con the uh, the questions on the chat session we will have to deal with them at the very end of uh, dr Tari's presentation so please keep yourself muted um in case of anything we will deal with it at the end of the presentation so dr Tari, um again a warm welcome to you we are really hoping to learn something to do and thank you so much for honoring our invite a second time as you can see these conversations um are really at the heart and soul of you know, the employee. And we really hope that we can be able to decode some of these things and take these conversations to the next level. So Karibu Sana, um, I always like to tell you the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mutoni. And it's really a pleasure for me to uh, uh, be with all of you here and uh, discuss some of the uh, condition that we've had a, an opportunity to manage and uh, once again thank you for considering uh, well myself and part of my team as I mentioned last time to come and speak to you so it really gives us a you know a really great pleasure so a very good afternoon to you and to everyone who has logged in uh, well I felt that uh, it's it's good at least to have a different kind of um uh approach here instead of me making the presentation uh a colleague of mine uh to be with us today and i have a great pleasure uh to introduce um a friend of mine and uh, i call him my brother uh dr charles moriuki dr charles moriuki is a um is a gynecologist he's also a laparoscopic surgeon is my colleague, we you know, an endometriosis specialist, and uh, we share quite a lot. And our passions have uh, directed us to a direction that um, has been very, very interesting. And we, we, I think, we have a lot of stories together, uh, trying to demystify and uh, advocate and improve access to uh, reproductive health. And uh, I, I know I gave him a very short notice, but I think we're always ready to come and cover each other. So I asked, you know, not long ago, if you'd be more than, if you'd be willing to give the presentation today. And um, yeah, he accepted to be part of this team. So uh, Dr. Charles Moriuki, once again, thank you so much. Uh, this is a great team and uh, be ready for questions and interaction. Uh, of course, as you're aware, majority of them are advocates. So be very careful with your wordings here. 
you know, just just by the way. Uh, but I, I think last time I was here, we had such a, a, a an interesting um, exchange. Um, so please, Karibu Sana, and uh, thank you very much for honoring um, uh, my invitation to be here and give your your talk. So welcome, Dr. Charles. Um, I hope you can all see me and. Uh... Asante sana for this honor, Dr. Njagi. Dr. Njagi is my brother uh, for, for, better, for lack of better words. And, um, and uh, yes, I am privileged to be within um, uh, the learned fraternity, they call them the learned friends. Um, and I think uh, I'll stand guided <laughs> in regards to how to approach all this. For way of introduction, I, I usually prefer Q&A. Um, but I'll just give a very brief uh, description of PCOS and then delve into, into the Q&A. Um, perhaps just by way of introduction, say PCOS is just uh, um, you know, an abbreviation for polycystic ovarian syndrome or ovary syndrome. And generally, it's a hormonal uh, condition that presents in various ways. And I'll just paint three scenarios, and then maybe we can be able to appreciate how it presents. So for the first scenario, we have a 24-year-old girl, okay? Um, she has just noticed that, you know, previously her periods were regular, but now they are irregular. Um, and she notices that she can go for almost two to three months without seeing her periods, and thereafter... You know, when the periods come, there's a bit of spotting, sometimes bright red, and the flow might go almost for two weeks. Now she comes concerned that this bleeding is unusual and a bit erratic and not, you know, uh, in keeping with what she expects and it's affecting basically the quality of her life. Um, of note, you know, she has noticed that she is, she gained a bit of weight. Um, maybe the last six months um, so that's the only con concern that she has then another scenario is a 32 year old um, we could call her uh, rose she has been trying to get pregnant for the last three years um, she's wondering why it's taking too long um, and of concern she knows her periods you know were just irregular ever since she started having her periods there's not a much much of an issue about that in any case. Um, she didn't she didn't have much much bleeding. The only thing is that now she's trying to get pregnant. She's ready, but it's taking too long to get pregnant. Okay. And then we have a 19 year old girl who has just finished uh, high school, is trying to join campus, and her main concern is that she she has acne. And um, it doesn't look quite well for her being at that age. And, you know, all her peers are wondering what's happening. And then unusual concern as well is that she just noticed she has some bit of small hairs on her face, um, which from time to time she needs to shave or wax. Okay. So um, basically that is uh, what I'd want to highlight that for the first case, a 24 year old um, who has just noticed the period is irregular um, for the last six months. Um, this is what we call irregular bleeding due to polycystic ovarian syndrome. So basically um, uh, her periods have become quite erratic. Uh, we, we usually talk about periods being absent or periods being irregular and she's having less than you know, uh, regular cycles in a year. Um, and the only concern that she has had and noticed is weight gain. So I'll just delve into the first presentation. So this is irregular bleeding. There are many other causes of irregular bleeding, uh, some of them being either a thyroid issue um, or um, a hormonal issue that, you know, could affect the, the, the body and, you know, cause somebody not to have periods. But even issues that, you know, we, we usually assess in the uterus, you know, for instance, uh, growths like polyps can cause irregular bleeding. 
uh, fibroids can cause irregular bleeding. Um, and adenomyosis, which is part of our fat topic, can cause irregular bleeding. But of note, this is bleeding that is irregular due to the hormonal imbalance caused by polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay. The second case, um, we have a 32-year-old who has been trying to get pregnant. And now the presentation in to the us, to us as doctors or gynecologists would be periods are irregular. So um, if at all, you know, somebody has been trying for a while. Um, you really need to ascertain what exactly is the cause of this delay in getting pregnant. And poly polycystic ovarian syndrome can cause a delay in getting pregnant because in the months that the periods are not coming, the, the ovulation is not happening. Because research shows us that 95% of women with regular periods or regular cycles are actually ovulating. So this might be the only presentation challenges or delay in getting pregnant. That is not to say that they can't get pregnant, it's just that there might be a delay because they're not ovulating every month, okay? Then we have a 19 year old who is disturbed by acne. Um, and acne is one of the symptoms of polycystic ovarian syndrome or a hair in areas that you don't expect. Basically, you don't expect uh, hair on the face or on the abdomen or basically a male pattern of hair. This is what we call hirsutism. And this is caused by the excess androgens uh, that the body uh, is producing, which is in keeping with polycystic ovarian syndrome. There are other symptoms that can cause that, including thinning of the hair if it's quite extreme. But of note is that there is a difficulty in losing weight, or there may be a sudden gain of weight, which can push somebody over to irregular periods and polycystic ovarian syndrome. And why does this happen? This happens because as somebody gains weight, the fat cells start producing estrogen. And estrogen causes the imbalance and triggers the polycystic ovarian syndrome, okay? Um, so generally speaking, that is how it presents. But somebody might ask, what are the different categories? Because there are different categories. So you might have um, a situation where you uh, having irregular ovulation. And in this chart, you can actually see there's an irregular ovulation, meaning that they are not having regular cycles. There is excess androgen hormones, so they might come with acne or you know excessive hair. And when an ultrasound scan is done, there is um, a feature of what we call polycystic ovaries. And I'll just show you how that looks. Sometimes it might be a bit scary when you know the doctor or whoever is doing the scan tells you, oh, we can see very many cysts. That, that's not to say that there's anything alarming. It's just that there are a couple of um, cysts. And the reason why they are there is because as the body starts ovulating, uh, the ovary starts uh, producing eggs and they get what you call recruited. And I'll just show you that. Are, are you able to see that image? Are we able to see that image yes. on the screen? Yeah, so you have what looks like a like a beaded pattern. So whatever is uh, showing like um, um, small spherical circles, those are actually eggs uh, in the ovary. So the body is not able to select one to be released as ovulation. So the, there is that state of dormancy where the eggs are in that state and ovulation does not happen. This is what we call a polycystic uh, ovary. So that is a full blown uh, phenotype. It's called A. And this is one that is most prevalent. We are concerned about it because there is a higher chance of being associated with obesity. So there's a higher chance of it being associated with insulin resistance and a likelihood of causing changes that are in keeping with changes in the lipid profile, changes in uh, how the body handles the metabolism and increased chance of diabetes, increased chance of, you know, adverse, um, you know, what we call risk of cardiovascular disease, okay? Um, then you do have a variation where, you know, for instance, maybe you do not have um, polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, but there's irregular periods and maybe excess um, androgen or excess androgenic features like the acne and the hair, or a variation in type C where you do have regular periods, but there's excess androgen and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, or a variation of uh, in D where you have regular ovulation um, 
and polycystic ovaries, but you don't have any features of excess androgen. Why do we discuss this? And it's called a syndrome because there isn't quite one size fits all. It's a spectrum. And it's a spectrum that varies from person to person for those with PCOS. And generally there are those rules that we usually would uh, almost like uh, indicators that we need to check out for. And at least if there are two out of three uh, uh, of, this, of, this, of these symptoms or two out of three of these evaluations and we think that somebody does have PCOS. So what is thought to cause PCOS? PCOS is thought to be genetic. And I won't belabor into what types of genes are you know, supposedly causative of PCOS, but genes we know do contribute significantly to many uh, conditions. Um, and one of them being polycystic ovarian syndrome. So the treatment is basically based on what is the most concerning issue. And I'd go back to, for instance, this 24 year old girl who has irregular periods. Um, and now is concerned that you know, the periods are becoming irregular and they are you know, erratic. So you'd be surprised for us to say that the first point of concern or first point of care would be diet and exercise. This is standard for all patients with PCOS because losing even 5% of your weight can actually push a patient with PCOS back to regular cycles. Um, so diet and exercise, and when you say diet, we usually recommend that, uh, to a patient to see a dietitian um, um, and, and generally give it at least six months of trying. Um, for patients who might feel it's taking too long. Sometimes we put them on hormonal pills. So we use hormonal contraceptive pills to balance the hormones to make them regular. That's one of the options. Um, and then um, for those who feel they do not want hormonal pills, then we usually would recommend uh, medications to just trigger their periods to come. Because every three months, it's important for a woman to see her periods every three months. Because if it goes beyond three months, then we increase the likelihood of changes in the inner lining of the uterus that can potentially lead to cancer of the uterus. For this 32-year-old called Rose who has irregular periods that is just trying to get pregnant, then that's a different case. So now our focus is on how to help her get pregnant. So we'll give her medication uh, to help her trigger uh, more, uh, ov uh, more ovulation cycles. So basically medication that will help boost her ovaries to, to get pregnant. Sometimes we do add a medication called metformin, which you know people get confused about because it's medication that's used to treat diabetes, but it actually helps reduce the insulin resistance, which is part and parcel of the disease, and that contributes to a struggle getting pregnant. For the 19-year-old who has acne, we actually now treat the acne itself, and there are different con medications that we can use to treat the acne. Some we actually would recommend a type of contraceptive pill called Yasmin or Diane that actually also uh, makes the skin smooth. And for most likely a 19-year-old who is active in campus, they might need beyond just uh, something to make their periods regular. They might need something to also uh, make their skin smooth. Um, some of them might be sexually active and then the pill will also, um, so to speak, have dual uh, activity in the sense of being able to give contraception. I, uh, I allow me to stop here so that I can now get to hear questions from you and be able to address them. Um, I think it's best to not go so much into the nitty gritty because the, the rest of it is pretty much a lot of science and, and, and the genes and, and all that. Is that okay? The Zoom platform back to Dr. Njagi or? Okay, um, thank you so much, Charles. I think um, we can get guided questions from the participants. So anyone with a question before um, Dr. Chan proceeds? Somebody can also type the, the, the questions. Yeah, so there's a question. How does yes. it affect performance at the workplace? What symptoms will be prevalent? That's from Joy. So that's a good question. So generally what happens is that I think we, we always assume that periods will always be regular. So um, sometimes women might get the discomfort of just 
having the periods not being regular. And all of a sudden, you just have this gush of flow um, that is quite uncomfortable. And especially it can be heavy and prolonged. Uh, most women will test, attest to the fact that this would be one of the last things you'd want to experience in the workplace when you're not prepared with, you know, uh, with your sanitary products. The other issue is just the whole concept of hormonal imbalance. Some women do get uh, hormonal changes that comes a lot with mood swings, um, uh, comes a lot with uh, fatigue. So those are the symptoms that sometimes can, can present. Um, uh, luckily, PCOS does not cause pain. Um, but also we tend to assume that, you know, things like, you know, how you look is important. And I think how you present yourself is also important. So anything that can affect your appearance for a woman, I have never seen a woman refuse a pill that would make her skin smooth for those who are struggling with acne or maybe facial hair that would reduce that. I've had instances where a couple of my patients have had to um, go a process of, uh, you know, uh, either waxing or even do a bit more detailed surgery to remove the, the hair follicle completely, just because it affects their, their, the, the way they perceive themselves and the way they're seen. So I think those are the, the most uh, common um, effects of PCOS. Uh, so Dr. Terry, there was one more question. Um, how... Yes. Um, how do I cope with the mood changes? I know you really talked about um, a couple of drugs that probably you can prescribe, but yes. um, if you were to look at um, something that is non-evasive in terms of medicine, what exactly would that be? How does this person cope with the mood changes accompanied by PCOS? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think uh, overall, I think we underestimate the importance of something like exercise, good rest and good sleep. Um, I know you guys being professionals, uh, we joke around in our circles and say sleep is for the weak and for the dead. So sometimes even sleep is, you know, sleep deprivation is a reality in the tense, in the, in the, in the setting of how much is required. But exercise is a good thing. I think there are some firms that have actually almost like incorporated this as part and parcel of their routine that they either, you know, allow people to either uh, have time out to, you know, either, you know, go out for workouts uh, or gym membership. But I think it's just trying to also encourage that type of culture, you know. Um, for instance, there are places where I know people are encouraged to use the lift. People are encouraged to use the stairs instead of using the lift. But exercise is a good thing. Exercise has been shown not only to reduce the risk of, you know, uh, as I said, losing 5% of your weight can actually push a woman with PCOS back to regular cycles. But it's not only beneficial in PCOS, it's beneficial in patients with diabetes, it's beneficial in patients with heart disease, it's beneficial in patients with uh, excess lipid profile. Um, and even when it comes to bone and bone structure, reduction in the weight on the, on the joints, reduction in joint takes, and even protecting your spine. So essentially that's one of the things. When it comes to diet, I think diet is one of the things that sometimes gets ignored because basically you are what you eat. So if you eat junk, chances are that it will show. So there is a, there's a potential of uh, people eating junk or eating healthy, but eating uh, portions that are not really ideal. For instance, there is a tendency to just grab your breakfast very fast. Either for you guys, either going to the law firm or you have to report to court, you skip lunch. Then in the evening, you almost compensate by eating twice as much as you know you would have eaten. And generally, we usually say we recommend eating breakfast like a king, eating your, your, your lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper because at night, you're likely to not need all that energy and all those calories. So if you eat twice as much, at night, then that means your body will just go and pack that excess weight. So we don't have a good eating culture as Kenyans, uh, maybe I, I should say Africans. Um, and then there is a tendency to also uh, have huge portions in terms of uh, carbs. For instance, if you have to take a standard plate, a quarter of that plate should be carbs, not a half. And the half should probably be, um, a, you know, more fiber and vegetables. 
I mean, you can do that. You can take that plate four times in a day. But if you are to take the portions, then that would be what you recommend. I have also had instances because PCOS is also one of the, the conditions that can affect women who, uh, when they get pregnant, then they have a higher chance of developing diabetes in pregnancy. This is a conversation that we always have to have. It's not just about the portions that are eaten, also the snacks. So there's a tendency to, yes, say, I will eat healthy and then the snacks becomes, I'm not feeling so well, let me just grab a milkshake um, and an Oreo shake. I mean, so we all have those bad days, but every day cannot be a bad day to soothe yourself with, a, with an Oreo shake or something. So they are cheat days and I agree, but it cannot be every day. So the snacks also in between the meals are important to take note of. For instance, they are healthier snacks. You probably would want to think of things like nuts, a fruit, uh, or fruits as opposed to um, you know, a bag of uh, uh, crisps or something of that sort. So basically, it's just understanding that incrementally we are becoming less active than our fathers were or our parents were. We are becoming more, uh, we, we sit for more hours. We are not as active. We probably eat as much or probably more than they did. And then we hope to get a healthy lifestyle which doesn't quite fit in. So if you are to ask me, PCOS can be termed both as a genetic disease that is affected by our lifestyle. So it can actually be made worse as a, as a lifestyle uh, disease because of the choices that we make. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I can still um, see more questions on the call. I can just um, read them out. So we have um, Susan who's asking, how do you deal with extreme cramps associ associated with left menstrual flow, first time occurrence? So left is cramping pain with the menstrual flow. If I get, is that the question? Cramping pain with the menstrual flow? Yes, how do uh, extreme cramps with less mm -hmm. menstrual flow? And this has happened for the first time. Okay, so yeah, that, that's, that's one of the things that we might need to evaluate and see what is causing this. Because when you talk about pain, usually PCOS does not cause menstrual pain. Uh, when you talk about menstrual pain, now we are talking about conditions that we need to evaluate like endometriosis and adenomyosis. And I think Dr. Njagi did elaborate further uh, on, 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 on this endometriosis because sometimes uh, pain may not be, uh, pain is not a, a symptom of PCOS. However, it is not necessarily endometriosis only. It could be, um, it, it could be ovulation-related pain. But if we're talking about pain during the periods, then we have to consider that it's not ovulation-related. It could be a cyst. It could be some inflammation that you know can be caused by infection, or it could be um, endometriosis. Sometimes there's pain that presents that is not related to. The, the, the reproductive organs, it could be pain, um, uh, infection in the kidney that might be confused as pain that is you know, associated with either the ovary or the uterus. So I think that might need a bit more evaluation to, to find out what's the cause of that. Um, thank you for that answer. The second, uh, we also have another question from Magdalene Kiyoko. Um, can yeah. PCOS cause permanent infertility? Um, so permanent infertility, no, it cannot cause permanent infertility. What it might cause is something called subfertility. Basically, what you're simply saying, <laughs> I almost said legally speaking, you there's an ovary and an egg, and there is a sperm from the partner. So legally speaking, or scientifically speaking, the two can meet. It might not be necessarily inside the body, it can be outside the body, but it doesn't cause permanent fertility. It's just cause delayed, delayed fertility because there are some. Uh, some cycles where ovulation is not necessarily happening. So that's that's not permanent, it's just delayed fertility. And there's treatment for that. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have... Oh, yes. There's another question from Diana. Would having other forms of contraceptives, like the implant, affect fertility where one has PCOS? And is it possible for the hormonal pill to backfire? So, uh, interesting question. Um, basically, an implant is 
uh, a, 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 a contraceptive method that has one hormone called progesterone. So it will not affect fertility where one has PCOS. Um, because once you remove the implant, the return to fertility is immediate. Um, if there's any delay, then we're probably talking about either an effect of PCOS, but delay needs to be clarified because the chance of getting pregnant in one cycle is actually 33%. So one out of three couples will only get pregnant uh, if you give them one month. And there's nothing wrong with the other two. It's just that they need time. So usually say we only evaluate after 12 months of trying for those who are less than 35 years and six months of trying for those who are above 35 years. The other part of the question, is it possible for the hormonal pills to backfire? To backfire in terms of fertility, in terms of contraceptive method, yes, they can backfire because uh, the challenging thing with hormonal pills is the inconsistency. So if people are skipping pills, so if one or two pills are skipped, then that's a concern. To the extent that we actually say, if somebody is taking contraceptive pills and they miss more than two pills, they need an additional contraceptive method for the next seven days before uh, the protective effect of a pill is, 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 is resumes. So if the pill is being taken consistently, more often than not, um, if it's to make the periods regular, it doesn't backfire. But even with consistent use, the failure rate of hormone pill is around one in 200, which is 0.5%. So there's, no, there's nothing absolute, to be honest, but the, the method that has the lowest failure rate is the implant, which is a failure rate of one in 10,000. Thank you. Great, thank you for that answer. Uh, do we have any more questions before Dr. Charles proceeds? I see no more questions on the chat box. Um, Dr. Charles, you can proceed. I mean, I don't have further questions, but the the, the interesting the interesting thing I see uh, about PCOS and any hormonal imbalance is there is an there is an overemphasis on uh, uh, trying something herbal. I don't know what your thoughts are about uh, herbal pills. Uh, I have in interacted with this um, herbal medication called Arorret in a couple of patients. And I don't think there's anything wrong with trying something, but the only thing is that it's not been validated. Um, uh, and so we always get a bit more on sun because we don't know the effects on the kidney. So before you start on a herbal pill, you know, sometimes it's, it's and I've seen even a herbal monthly pill that people use for contraception it does cause a lot of destabilization. And sometimes people think that, you know, this is a patient with PCOS, but it's just an external effect of, you know, a herbal pill that is taken monthly. So I think that's to emphasize that you know, we, we, we are in a position to influence even those around us who might actually be tempted to use herbal medication without a proper assessment. And the problem is that these herbal concoctions are usually sold as uh, wonder drugs that can treat fibroids, infertility, endometriosis, PCOS, name it. And there's no regulation about them. So we end up just finding people at the tail end of, you know, having used so much money. And sometimes when you think about an issue like fertility in PCOS or any other condition. A fertility is one of those things that, you know, the outcomes really are heavily dependent and pegged on the woman's age. So the, high, the earlier the, the patient is assessed and treated, the better the outcome. So we, we, we probably should look into ways of uh, ensuring that people can access care and access the correct information. Uh, but PCOS is a manageable disease and a manageable condition. It's probably made worse by lifestyle changes. So I think um, we should emphasize the fact that uh, it's a condition that can be treated and a condition that can be managed with the women who are suffering from this being able to be supported uh, in the best way possible. Santi. Um, Doctor, I think I just want to ride on, on that um, herbal, herbal medication. And now let's legally speak. Eh? <laughs> let's legally yeah. speak because I do believe that um, they probably have a mark for kebs, right? Um, and that's the reason they're in the market and they're being distributed, God knows, everywhere. Um, I think I've seen all these things in, you know, certified pharmacies. So 
I can see all that. And me as a customer, I am not going to a proper assessment. I'm not coming to, to your, I'm not coming to your clinic for assessment, but somehow because I've had um, mamas on Facebook have said, this is the new one, a drug. Like what's the balance um, from a medical perspective? Because these things have kept certificate, but at the end of the day, it seems the consumer is not, is not concerned with assessment. They just want this wonder drug. What's that balance between that? Because I think there's a gap in terms of consumer information or knowledge or omen of things. I think we, we need to accept that we do have a challenge in this country about regulation. And it's not just regulation in terms of uh, even medical products. We actually might have challenges and we do have challenges, even medication that comes to the black market. But as regards this, I usually would emphasize that it might cost you a bit more to see a specialist um but it actually would be the prudent thing to do sometimes we even run medical camps for free um uh, just like you probably do also have legal camps for free to just offer free legal advice because you actually find people who have been suffering yet they probably just needed one or two you know pieces of information for them to make better decisions legally but if we are not able to make it easier for kenyans to see professionals or even uh demystify the cost implications because people suffer way more. I mean, if you take how about pills and kidneys get damaged, you're looking at dialysis. So it would probably be better to have that. It's difficult to control and regulate hormonal contraception, but I think the pharmacy and poisons board is doing its utmost best to be able to uh, source, uh, test, and actually, you know, do investigations and actually visit the companies where these products are made. So if, before you register a product, it's a certified requirement that pharmacy and poison support need to visit that manufacturing plant, whatever it is, whether it's in India, whether it's in Germany. But this has not prevented from uh, us from having products that probably you know, go through the illegal routes to, uh, to arrive here. So I think the onus is on whoever is accessing the healthcare to seek the best information possible. So before starting any herbal medication to probably say, can I just see a specialist and have a second opinion on this? Um, uh, I think that's the best we can do um, for now. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think another question that I see uh, from, the, from the registration form was, in terms of diet and exercise, and I really know that you have belabored that um, at the end of it all, there is an element that if you use non-invasive medical ways and practices, you can actually manage PCOS. So the question is, are there any particular exercises that need to be attested, or this is just your normal exercises that bring down your weight, like you said, 5% of it, 5% of it can actually make a very huge change. Are there specific workouts for this, or is it just your general, you know, workouts that just bring down your weight? That's the question. Okay, that's an interesting question. The the truth of the matter is um, exercise. There's what we think exercise is, and there's also what exercise they really should be able to look at. So I'm not saying that people need to all register in the gym. I, I usually would recommend. I usually start by asking, what would you term as good form of exercise for some people they are okay with swimming so that would be the best way of working out for others they might not be comfortable with swimming they might want to cycle others they might decide you know i don't do any of that so let me do walking or jogging so basically how we look at it is simply saying you need at least uh, 15 minutes of aerobic exercise that basically means you're burning calories um, and you're able to expend that energy. So in, for instance, if it's a walk, I usually tell patients, uh, it has to be a brisk walk. You have to really walk, walk out and you, from there you're going back straight to the shower. It's not, uh, it's not a leisure walk. So it has to be one where it's actually making you expend more energy. Um, if you are able to do every day, so you're looking at cumulatively at least uh, one and a half hour, one to one and a half hours in a week. So you might say alternate days, 30 minutes, that's also fine. But research shows it's better to do, let's say 15 minutes every day, as opposed to one hour, one and a half hours, one day a week. 
because just just looking at how the body works um it's probably better to do that and small workouts are better than one big huge workout even on your joints and things like that so that is how i look at exercise and um sometimes we 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 also recommend that you might actually also get into a fitness uh regime and also have a fitness coach there are many fitness coach nowadays there are many other you know uh, coaches that also go through diet and also have a personal one-on-one -on -one to look at what do you eat how do you eat what time do you eat it and what is your target but basically the the challenge we have with diet and exercise it's not a quick fix like medication and i see most patients struggle with that because it's very hard to tell them to go for six months uh you know in terms of diet and exercise before they get pregnant or try to get pregnant people just, just don't have that time i mean they made plans and budgeted this is the year this is the year we get pregnant so if you tell me six months that's too long a time but actually there has to be some patients i've not seen um you know diet and exercise that fixes something in a month it probably is a longer period of time so there are other modalities of trying to lose weight, which I have not gone into. And these are, you know, probably coming up more and more in our country. I have colleagues who do bariatric surgery. Um, and basically this means, you know, either fitting a balloon inside the stomach that actually makes the stomach, it takes a part of the space of the stomach so that whenever somebody eats, they get full quickly. So they don't have to eat so much. But these are not for everyone. It's probably for those people who... Um, they are they actually do get their weight more from what they eat and and there are some procedures that are also done to reduce the size of the stomach they're called gastrectomies or sleep gastrectomies these are just procedures that are procedures that are not coming more and more but i think we are looking at a situation where we have we have we have quickly advanced to the most you know industrialized and westernized of countries we are actually dealing with obesity as a crisis and is not helping much. And even, even, even talking with fellow pediatricians, they are seeing childhood obesity, especially in Nairobi, as being one of the challenges that they will have to face because childhood obesity is not a condition that most people understand. Most of us would feed our children and they're happy to feed them more. I don't know why it's an African thing. If you feed a child and they, they, they open their mouth and you put more food, you just feel there's a joy and a satisfaction that comes from it. But if you look at that child, you're actually not doing quite well because there's also restrictions. We're not as um, free. They're not as free to play as we used to. They don't, you know, maybe they stay in the flat. They would go out for a walk in the sun, come, bask, eat, sleep, uh, play with toys and things like that. So it's actually a spectrum that we have to look at and look at the choices that we are making, both for ourselves and for our children. Uh, but diet and exercise and portion control is something that we need to we need to we need to factor in. Why am I talking about this? And I am a gynecologist because I have seen that it's very easy to come and talk about medication. I can write a list of drugs that we can give to manage PCOS, but you see, that's a very short-term, quick response. You're looking at a solution that is also going to be long-term, and I think I'm now appreciating and embracing more and more preventive care than just curative care. So I think that's a very important aspect. And maybe this would be a good session to have together with a fitness coach and a nutritionist side to side. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Tari. Um, the last one, the, the last time we had uh, Dr. Joe, the conversation yes. about um, you know insurance companies. In fact, one of the participants asked us to bring an insurance company on board to also have this conversation. But what came out of our previous conversation with uh, Dr. Ju was the fact that sometimes even trying to address these things from a medical insurance perspective, you will find that the insurance companies are not embracing um, either this as part and parcel of the cover or things like that. I'm just curious, is this also something that befalls uh, PCOS? or is endo a special breed of things and PCOS has mm -hmm. been excluded? Does uh, the problem still start here as well? So my 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 challenge, I mean, usually is to, it's very easy to just, it's not easy to break down disease and say, you know, my, my head is aching and that's just it. I need to just treat my head. 
um, you know, disease tends to affect the whole body. And if you are going to address a condition, for instance, endometriosis, you have to look at it from the broad spectrum. And there are many specialists involved, like for instance, now diabetes, for instance, if you look at it, if you look at PCOS, PCOS affects a woman who is maybe trying to get pregnant, so fertility becomes a concern. A challenge I have is that insurance companies will say, oh, you know, we don't pay for fertility treatment. But then if it comes in the presentation of acne, they are able to pay for it. If it presents with the condition of irregular bleeding, they're able to pay for it. So they are not really in a condition and a capacity to understand the spectrum of the disease and why it's important to not ignore one aspect of it. Again, if you are to treat it and treat it by yourself, you'll miss out on critical elements like diet and exercise. For instance, somebody who is not pregnant with PCOS, they need to see a diabetologist, for instance, because maybe their sugars are out of control. So they, the, the truth of the matter is we also need to more or less have advocacy with the insurance companies to, for them to understand that um, we can't treat one aspect of the body and ignore the rest. And, then, and, and you, know, you can't just treat a 19-year-old with acne and assume that that's enough because if you don't follow through, that patient will eventually get pregnant. So again, you have to come back and address that issue. But slowly, I'm seeing insurance companies that tend to offer health insurances abroad are becoming more and more open to preventive care. They even give you brownie points. For instance, if you go to the gym and you log in hours in the gym, then they actually notice that, yes, they'll give you some points that will probably add up and give a discount to your premiums just because they appreciate that if somebody is working out every day or maybe three times in a week, in the long run, five to 10 years, they're unlikely, they're likely to have less risk of a stroke, less risk of, di less risk of diabetes and things like that. So they are looking at it at a incentive perspective so that they can actually say, you know, we're actually reducing the costs that we'll have to pay out for healthcare because this person is working out. And if you actually ask me, that's a good model. If I was told that you know, if I work out and I log in and I show and it shows in my in whatever platform that there is, I will get a discount in my premiums. Uh, and it's, it's a win-win because insurance will probably pay less. So there's more that needs to be done. There's more uh, uh, conversations that we need to have. Sometimes what I say is when you're writing or you're engaging healthcare insurances, I tend to be a bit more biased and say we need to have more women in that boardroom to, to probably make those decisions because Sometimes what is offered looks, you know, very wonderful, but you might miss out on subtle things that, you know, involve women care. So you might find that, yes, you're given a cover of 10, 15 million per year. Um, but when it comes to something like maternity cover, it's something like 150, 200 K. Um, and only the women who are in that boardroom would understand that that's not sufficient to cover. You know, it's, it's just trying to have um, a wholesome approach so that you can engage you'd be very surprised that companies that used to have, you know, their, 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 their desires upfront with insurance companies used to get better deals. Uh, and I'll probably cite one like Safaricom. It would, it would actually ensure that their, their, their staff also get contraceptive care. Uh, so you'd see a patient with the same insurance um, and a different uh, cover altogether. So you, I, and I used to wonder, why would they do that? But I think they, they looked at it and said, this is exactly what we need for our staff. So the question again would be, the onus is on you to say, what, what would you need in terms of your healthcare needs um, as a law firm? What healthcare needs are you looking at? What are the struggles? What are the challenges that people are having in accessing healthcare? What is not being paid up for? Um, I've never understood, for instance, why insurance companies, for instance, would not want to pay for contraception uh, yet they will gladly pay for an, uh, antenatal care and delivery. I, I mean, which which is cheaper? It's contraception that is cheaper. Why not? Why not just pay for that? Yeah, thanks. I don't know whether I've deviated, but I'm just trying to give my perspective on things. I think that's loud and clear, Doctor. I hope that you can hear me as well. Um, yes. Very well answered. Um, unless there's anybody else with a question, um, there's no more questions from the from the form that you filled in. So unless there's anyone else with a question, I like to do it like the auctioneer, going once, going twice, 
and the gong is down. So we're going thrice. So we, we leave it at that. I don't know, Dr. Rijo, whether you had anything to add um, with regards to everything else that Charles has said before we bring this to a close. Well, no, I was actually just writing a message that I need to step out for a second. I have an emergency, but um, no, I, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, he, you know. Hi, Joe, we uh, lost you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, no, a phone call came, came through. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much, Charles, uh, for the great presentation. And uh, yeah, PCOS is, uh, you know, a condition that, you know, sometimes can uh, be, uh a bit of a challenge and sometimes not well understood. Uh, it can be a challenging to us as well, especially in fertility. But uh, uh, just as you've clearly put it, uh, it you know, it's something that we can manage and uh, mostly uh, by watching our lifestyle. So thank you very much always for coming in. And Smudoni, thank you for uh, giving us an opportunity. It looks like this family is getting bigger. So if you invite my seven Moyuki next time, I think we're going to bring another brother of ours. And uh, <laughs> Thanks yeah, for having yeah. us, Madoni. Thanks yeah. for having us. Thanks, Joe, for inviting me. I really appreciate this. Right. Thank you. <laughs> An honor. Right. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, gentlemen. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure. As you can see, this is a topic that really touches on, you know, so many women who are in the workplace. And a lot of the questions that have been streaming in, it's because the wellness of the employee affects the productivity, which I keep saying goes back to the employment contract, which then again affects employment law. Basically, it's a whole cycle. As I keep saying, the law is not a vacuum. Um, we, we, we live in an operation where every single thing that affects us has probably a legal element uh, around it. And it's important to, as I said, to decode and understand if I'm an employer, um, what do I need to do to support the wellness of my employee who is a lady and who is going to go through all these things um, within their bodies. So thank you so much, Charles. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Njagi, for um, gracing us with your presence and your presentation, uh, Dr. Charles. We do hope to have this conversation. I like the fact that um, you have also, you know, um, instigated us to think through in terms of the next conversation should actually also be about diet, nutrition, and all manner of things. I do believe that I agree with you that all these things people are taking up within the streets, all these concussions, uh, people should be well aware of what exactly they are taking up. I, I chuckled because um, when you were talking about um, insurance and if we could get bonga points for working out, I thought about the Subaru boys, you know? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they get excluded from insurance but I think here yeah, from a medical perspective it is great that it tells us please just go and work out and you'll get some points and insurance is going to you know tag along with you so thank you so much um, ladies and gentlemen I do leave this here um, <laughs> I leave this here I hope I've not touched enough somebody's laughing in the chat session if you are a Subaru person I'm sorry I, I'm, I, actually I'm, actually I'm actually one I'm actually one I'm actually one <laughs> my, apologies, my apologies <laughs> yeah, my apologies my first yeah apologies um that was just in connection because it's in the limelight so just allow me to just um leave it at that but we do hope to further this conversation further 